Salams from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief. First up on the show today, the man to last serve as president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, died aged 91 in Moscow. The announcement came from Russia's Central Clinical Hospital, also known as the Kremlin Clinic, which is located in the Moscow suburb of, of Kuntsevo. The 1990 Nobel Peace Prize winner leaves behind a complex legacy. He is celebrated in the West as the man who ended the Cold War without bloodshed. But Gorbachev's somewhat naive and incoherent policies of openness and reconstruction, glasnost and perestroika as perhaps the most famous Russian words in the world, led to the emergence of all-powerful oligarchs under the regime of Boris Yeltsin soon after. A decade of massive trauma followed in Russia as well as other countries in the for former Soviet Union. We saw wars, color revolutions and severe economic distress. That led to Gorbachev, perhaps even more so than Yeltsin, being reviled at home and taking singularly much of the blame for the collapse of the Soviet Union. I spoke earlier to News Click Editor-in-Chief Prabir Pulkayasa for a historical perspective as well as what impact uh, Gorbachev's legacy has on modern-day relations between Russia and the West. Good to have you uh, on uh, Daily Debrief, Prabir, even though we're you know, talking about the death of uh, someone who was a world figure, irrespective of how you look at his legacy. Uh, I happened to spend a few years in Russia, uh, in Moscow specifically, in the early years, early Yeltsin years, from 92 to 96. Uh, so, have some uh, personal and also anecdotal accounts of who was responsible for really the misery that uh, the Russian people had to go through in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union. From a historical perspective, how, how do you view Gorbachev as a politician and a leader? Well, let's put it this way. Gorbachev's, Gorbachev's legacy at best is mixed. Mixed because he started the process of what would be called reforms in Soviet Union. And to that extent, there was a belief that Soviet Union, the reforms he was doing, were in fact would lead to strengthening of socialism because it would give it a democratic, uh, deeper democratic roots. This was the argument by a lot of the people who were uh, particularly in the West, who were leftist, but didn't really like the Soviet Union. Let's be very clear about it. Yeah. And uh, Gorbachev to, to them was somebody who could reform Soviet Union to something which would be acceptable to them. You know, in this, of course, what the miss was, what Soviet Union was for the rest of the world is missing. Because for us, the Soviet Union was in fact the, the major force which led to decolonization of the world. Without the Soviet Union, we really do not think decolonization would have happened, at least at the pace with, with which it did. A lot of the people also in different parts of the world saw them as the ones who defeated the Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. So the, the reaction to the rest of the world and to European or the Western world was really different. And for them, Gorbachev therefore represented, okay, now Soviet Union is going to become like, for instance, the Labour Party uh, run UK or the Socialist in France, Socialist Party in Germany. So a kind of uh, bourgeois liberal transformation of a Communist Party to uh, what would have been otherwise for them a transformation which would not have been accepted. Right. So this is for a large part of the West, this is the response. The rest of the world, uh, we felt, okay, maybe he would be able to reform uh, Russia, Soviet Union in a way that he could combine socialism with a certain degree of reform that he was talking about, more people's participation. But mm. at the same time, we had our fingers crossed because it also represented restoration of capitalist forces which are rising in Russia, Soviet Union, and which in fact, is what we see emerge in the Yeltsin years very clearly, who said, okay, Soviet Union, Russia, because that time Soviet Union had been, had been dissolved in 1991, that's what Yeltsin did. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of wealth. Now, how we, as the ones who control the state, how can we grab this wealth and privatize it? And there you had this whole set of people who helped them, and it was really led by the United States. In fact, Jeffrey Sachs was one of the key figures of that. And uh, Gaidar in uh, Russia, who talked about within 100 days, we'll transform the socialist economy 
to a capitalist economy by giving shares to the people. What was really a grab of the resources of all the enterprises that existed in Russia at the time and hand it over to what later on emerged as the oligarchs. So it was really handing over all the wealth of Russia, which were at that time in the hands of the companies, uh, the state-run companies, the state, yeah. and completely privatize it with under the leadership of the what is called the Numen nomenclatura or the ones who are running these enterprises, really, the bureaucratic <laughs> leaders of these enterprises. And they just pocketed the entire wealth of the country. And what you would have seen in 92 to 96 is that polarization of people, particularly those who had retired, who were therefore were entirely dependent on the essentially what the state was going to give them, their pension. Yeah. And that uh, because the Russian ruble collapsed under Yeltsin, their, their money was, the pension was worth nothing. Mm. And we had terrible scenes that we saw at that time what happened in Russia. But the other big uh, tragedy was the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself. Now, all of these were not essential. And we saw the transformation, for instance, that China did, that it opened itself to the market, but it did mm. it under the control of the state and also kept the levers of political power in their hands. We saw the emergence of also the capital, uh, big capitalists in China, but at the same time, they were able to give control over the process and did a transformation economically, which maybe Gorbachev was also trying for, if we are trying to be kind to him. Mm. And uh, they, But that did not lead to the dissolution of the state and the destru destruction of the Chinese uh, structure. Okay. Yeah. itself, which is what happened under Gorbachev. So I will say Gorbachev, his intention, the best I can say, maybe he had good intentions. By the end of it, it was very clear, which he, in fact, he said it in the Central Committee, also, mm. that the intention finally was to become essentially a, a liberal socialist party of what you saw in Western Europe, the Labour Party, the French Socialist Party, and the German Socialist Party, and given the transformation they themselves have undergone, you can yeah. see the trajectory was a more gradual path to capitalist restoration rather than the uh, brutal restoration that capitalism had in the Union, mm -hmm. which led to the emergence of the oligarchs and large-scale looting of the wealth of the country as well as of the people. So my, my reaction to Gorbachev is not going to be a very kind one. And yeah. the only thing we can credit him for is, well, he and the other really divisive figure in the United States, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. they reached some agreement on nuclear bombs and disarmament, which has held us in good stead till the Bush Jr. came into the scene and took a, and the Trump later, who yeah. took, took a really a crowbar to the entire structure of disarmament that both he and Ronald Reagan had set in place and also followed by George Bush number one. Yeah, okay, senior, what yeah. is called Bush 41 in mm. the US terminology. So yes, some credit must be given that there was some positive fallout in the direction. It didn't last too long, but nevertheless, all such uh, moves towards peace are welcome. So yes, his other attempts were bumbling at the best and mm. uh, really uh, at worst, it was a blind seeking of something, of a path which was essentially for capitalist respiration, albeit at a slower pace, not at the pace which Yeltsin did. Thanks, Prabhu. I think we, we've uh, taken more time than we had. Uh, but, but thank you anyway for, for uh, taking us through uh, the past as well as uh, the sort of impact it's had on what's happening in world politics today. Next up, Indonesia has detained six army personnel in connection with the brutal murders of four civilians in the troubled West Papua region. The military has claimed that the civilians were attempting to buy weapons from these six soldiers and were killed when the deal went sour. The West Papua region is highly militarized and is the site of a decades-long low-intensity conflict between several small armed groups and the Indonesian state. Anish has more on this story. Uh, Anish, West Papua is a highly militarized part of uh, the world and the Indonesian military here 
uh, investigating its own officers for uh, wrongdoing and in this case probably amounting to murder as well. How significant is, is that as a first step? Well, in this case specifically, uh, it is significant in that there are obviously, uh, as we know, contradicting claims being made uh, by both sides. Uh, especially the Indonesian military. and But in, nevertheless, there is an attempt to at least investigate it. Uh, we are not very sure how uh, transparent this investigation is going to be. We are not very sure how uh, how likely justice is going to be in this case either. Uh, because we are also not very sure of the circumstances of this. You have to remember that West Papua is still uh, pretty much in a very uh, closed-off kind of firewall uh, where access to internet is often uh, disrupted by the government, but not just that, there are also, it's very difficult to even report from that place because you have movements often going underground, even civil society movements have very big difficulty to talk to uh, foreign uh, news reporters. So this is uh, not a place where certaining facts uh, just by claims can be possible at any point in time. So we have to wait and watch how uh, how it, uh, you know unravels how the military is going to conduct this investigation. But definitely, considering the fact that such uh, investigations are rarest of the rare, despite the fact that this uh, insurgency has been going on and the militarization has been going on for decades now, decades. Uh, this is uh, definitely something that is uh, that is at least an attempt. To a uh, pressure wall with him to limit the kind of damage that it has caused uh, mm -hmm. to the military's image and also to uh, Indonesia's image in the foreign, uh, the international community at large. Right. Perhaps a bit also in line with the ending reports of human rights violations on the part of the military there. Uh, but also, uh, Anish, uh, another positive might be that they've announced a joint investigation between the military and the police, so maybe some element of transparency might come out there. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. But for the time being, uh, what is the scenario? The, the, there has been, like you were mentioning, decades-long uh, insurgency, separatist f freedom uh, movement, several groups are active. Uh, and these have become deadlier in the recent past. So what is the latest from the region? So uh, the current phase of violence uh, is often uh, dated back to 2018. It's been four years since uh, this spate of violence has been going on. Uh, the military claims that it began with uh, separatists attacking military outposts and uh, officers. Uh, military, uh, the separatists, on the other hand, are claiming that it's the uh, but uh, it's something that began with uh, with attacks on their students. Uh, attacks, uh, racist attacks on uh, West Papuans in other parts of Indonesia. And so it is sort of like a complex situation right now. Uh, mm -hmm. We saw the uh, the outcome of, if not an outcome, but like the side effect of this uh, massive insurgency. It's, it's a low level insurgency. You have to remember that it's not really a massive sort of uh, sort of civil war situation, but it's like sporadic set of violence across hmm. the uh, land, uh, spread across months and years, but it has its own impact. It creates tensions between communities. It creates issues that where reconciliation can be a problem in the future. Uh, thousands of people have been displaced uh, hmm. because of this insurgency. And this was especially evident after the protests and the crackdown that happened uh, by the Indonesian government, the protests of 2019. Uh, it, it happened for a span of two months, and the, uh, spread out in the span of two months, peaceful protests, mostly by students and civil society groups demanding for uh, and, uh, laws or actions against racist uh, attacks on students and West Papuans in, across Indonesia. But uh, also certain, uh, also opposing the recent, as we talked about, the recent uh, uh, partition of the provinces yeah. into multiple smaller provinces without much autonomy. And so all of these were issues that were, that could have been peacefully resolved if there were attempts 
to talk, uh, to have talks, to uh, negotiate between by the government, but that did not happen. Instead, we got further militarizations. Hundreds of hundreds of uh, military uh, troops have reached West Papua. They're still there, and they pretty much uh, have dictated a lot of uh, the manner in which this conflict has moved forward to. And this is what we're seeing right now. The case, as you talked about, is quite horrifying. It's not something. It's not an uh, open and shut case as the military is trying to portray it to be. Uh, we, you do not have that sort of uh, a, a, a trade deal or an arms deal or a sting going on where bodies are mutilated in such a manner. But this happened, and this shows that the militarization, uh, the corrosive effect that it, ha- it is happening, it is having on civil society in West Papua, and it's it can have lasting damage. But we do not know how far it is going to go and how bigger an impact it is going to happen because it is, we have to also remember, it is a very uh, overlooked part of the world for most yeah. of the fact. And uh, because of the manner in which Indonesia is trying to open up mines and, uh, you know, uh, all, all sorts of projects to... The massive foreign, infrastructure exactly, project, yeah. uh, For foreign investors, uh, the, we are very unlikely to see this level of outrage that we see for some other... Uh, manufactured or real instances of human rights abuses from in different parts of the world. Right. Anish, thanks for that. I'll ask you to stick around because the next story is from the Caribbean, a part of the world that you are also covering uh, and uh, that we want to get, get you to weigh in on and it's a good story. So we'll come back to you in a minute. Right. So as I was saying, our final story for today, uh, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, a regional court that decides on cases from nine nations in the region, six of them independent and the other three Uh, British Overseas Territories, has deemed St. Kitts and Nevis' laws uh, criminalizing uh, homosexual behavior null and void. The court ruled that the colonial era anti-sodomy laws uh, adopted by the two island nations way back in 1873 are unconstitutional and in violation of the rights to privacy and freedom of expression. The ruling came after a petition was brought to the court by Jamal Jeffers, a gay man from the Caribbean nation, uh, along with a non-profit organization called the St. Kitts and Nevis Alliance for Equality. Luisa Cabal, UN AIDS uh, Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean, was among those who hailed the ruling, saying, and I quote, This landmark ruling is an important step forward in ensuring e- equality and dignity for the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community in St. Kitts and Nevis and the whole Caribbean. Today, St. Kitts and Nevis joins a growing list of Caribbean nations that have overturned these colonial era laws that deny people's human rights and hold back the response to the HIV pandemic. Everyone benefits from decriminalization. I think that is pretty much uh, something everyone will agree with. Uh, and we'll go back to Anish for more on that story. So, so we are seeing uh, from the region, at least, Anish, uh, a sort of trend of, of, of getting rid of these colonial era uh, laws, uh, it is of course a, a positive step. Uh, contextualize it for us, please. Yes, so there is definitely a progressive wave happening in the Caribbean where last month we saw Antigua and Barbuda uh, High Court uh, struck, uh, strike down a similar set of what, what were often called as in the past anti sodomy laws or anti bungalow laws. And this shows changing uh, attitudes, not just uh, from the political elites and the, uh, and the courts, but also the manner in which the public is perceiving this. Uh, it is not the most controversial thing right now in the Caribbean. Uh, and that is definitely a good step forward. You have to also remember that this is a colonial legacy, as you said, uh, and that itself shows how a whole host of uh, homophobic and anti-LGBT uh, legal uh, legal pr- processes that exist in the third world and much of the past uh, formerly colonized world is because of uh, our colonial legacies in themselves and that has its own history and baggage that really needs to be shared by a lot of countries. We we have now something like seven more uh, seven countries in the Caribbean still remaining to uh, decriminalize same-sex relationships. Uh, But there are definitely movements uh, afoot. There are uh, court cases, lawsuits that are still uh, ongoing and trying to do the same that St. Kitt and Nevis 
Nevis has done today. And that shows that it is not going to be a moment that is going to die down very soon. As I said, the progressive wave is also going to help impact the manner in which uh, courts perceive these uh, lawsuits and how they are going to uh, rule in many of these cases. And in the wider context, if you, if you look at it, the number of countries also, there are about uh, 68 countries, if I'm not wrong, that still criminalizes uh, homosexuality and same-sex relationships in different forms. Uh, and this includes some uh, far more developed countries like Singapore, which only recently announced uh, doing away with the colonial era laws uh, that decriminalize same-sex relationships, sorry, criminalize the same-sex relationships. So uh, it is still a massive work to be done. There, it, it's still just the first step towards uh, marriage equality and all sorts of uh, legal rights that are otherwise uh, denied to sexual minorities around the world and also in the Caribbean, but definitely a positive step forward and obviously showing how time is progressing for people around the world. Right. Thanks. Thanks very much, Anish. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Daily Debrief. As always, for more on these stories, head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org and give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. Until tomorrow, goodbye.